All right. Because I am being recorded, I like to just start off by reading the following disclaimer real quick. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this video audio belong solely to the author and not necessarily to affiliation, organization, committee, or other group or individual. No part of this video, including but not limited to names, events, places, storyline, may be transmitted, copied, photocopied, reproduced, translated, or reduced in any format, including but not limited to, to any electronic media machine, readable form, paper form, et cetera. Any other re reproduction of this form is prohibited. All materials and content contained in this video audio are project protected by law and may not be reproduced, distributed, transmitted, displayed, published, or broadcast in any form or manner without the written consent of the speaker. I do authorize this meeting to go ahead and record this meeting. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to all the newcomers. I am introducing myself as Anonymous, and I am a grateful recovering sex and love addict. In fact, uh, it wasn't too long ago uh, when I was guided to speak for another 45-minute uh, SLAA meeting, and I must admit that my first thoughts were <laughs> absolutely no way. It is not the right time yet. And um, then I reached out to a couple more people um, to try to speak at that meeting, and they mentioned me as well. And so I just realized that that was my higher power saying, okay, it's time. So I am grateful to be here. Um, this is my second 45 minute share. So I am excited to see what um, our, my higher power will bring to this uh, talk right here. So um, that being said, I, um, in addition to all of that, this, these were my initial thoughts when I was asked to speak. How am I going to speak for 45 minutes? I don't even know how to speak for four minutes and any like given share period, the beeper never goes off on me. And um, how much of the story do I tell? How much of recovery? And then what do people wanna hear? And how on earth am I going to put into words what may be valuable to others? Um, all this went through my head in a matter of milliseconds and uh, my heart was racing. My anxiety came over my body and then I finally took a deep breath and realized, okay, I can do this. Um, and I also realized that all of those negative thought patterns um, that were initial, uh, that's all part of my disease. That's part of my perfectionism. Um, the part of me that says I'm not enough, the part that it has a fear of judgment of others and that I am not worthy. And this is where kind of my addiction manifests today in my head. As I move forward and kind of talk, I just want to go through the structure real quick. Um, it should take about 30 to 45 minutes. And then the first 20 minutes, I will be diving into the depths of the addiction and where that took me. Um, the following scenes could be triggering. I will do my best to not be graphic. Please note that they are not meant to trigger anyone, but to paint a picture of what life was like. If you find yourself triggered to the point of needing to leave the meeting, I do encourage you to just press the mute button on your device, not the mute that you talk with, but the one that um, stops you from being able to hear. And then just re go ahead and re-enter in about 20 minutes um, to hear what recovery is like and the gifts of sobriety. And I'm just gonna start off by writing or reading the story that I wrote. It was a sunny day in early September. In fact, it was a sunny, after uh, or a Sunday after Labor Day. That summer, I bounced from four different bartending jobs, typically holding two positions at a time while still working in the real estate office. I had my own place. It was small, but it was my own place. No one to answer to, no one to wait on or wait on. No arguments about the television. In fact, no noise from the television. This place was my place, a place I called home. It had two small rooms, two small windows, some window AC units, and it was furnished. It was spectacular yet quaint. The neighborhood was full of quiet, quite mature individuals and very few children, which I found slightly odd. But nonetheless, these people were pleasant and accompanied by many dogs of all shapes and sizes. This place was perfect for me. See, I was in the process of consoling myself. It was that previous spring, the horrific event took place. All I wanted was to forget about it. I want others to forget about it. I wanted to be accepted again and not thought of as this crazy person or this liar. I wanted to 
my relationship back to the way it was before the incident. I just wanted something to live for again. And to me, that was the beginning of my journey to self-worth. Well, that's what I thought. It wasn't much longer when I received a text with a picture and a link with words stating, you should work here. I clicked the link and to my surprise, I had never heard of such a place, nor did I know these places existed. A couple of days later, another text, this time with a profile and a link, but also words of encouragement. You interested? You'd be great. I pondered for a few weeks, watched a few videos and shows. He and I had extensive conversations about safety. Each time I would rebuttal, he would give another reason as to why. You only live once. Why not get paid for something you enjoy? These statements and many others soon became my thoughts and my reality. This new promised life was full of beauty, passion, freedom, excitement, and connection. Sounds appealing, right? I took the leap. I emailed a few headshots, sent my measurements in bio, then nothing, absolutely nothing. Was I being rejected? No way was I going to be rejected. I wanted this, this new future. I called them. It was a piece of cake. I wasn't rejected at all. They put me in, they put me on the schedule and less than two weeks later, before getting off the phone, the lady explained, I needed to plan on staying for two weeks without leaving the premises, was to be dropped off with no car, and there would be limited cell phone use. And I would receive a confirmation email with a list of what to bring and what not to bring. I spent the next 10 days researching everything I could about the industry. I watched video after video, ordering new clothes, and prepared my body for perfection. I starved myself for over seven days, ran three times a day. I lost what seemed like 10 pounds that week. I was excited, and now I was finally ready, and my body was ready. I gave notice to my job that Friday. They let people go the same day. I told the real estate office I'd go on vacation. Saturday, I sent packing, then Sunday off we went. It was a four and a half hour drive and about two or about four hours into it, he asked, are you sure you want to do this? I nodded my head yes and simply said, if I don't, I will always wonder if I could. We arrived and he parked the car out front. I opened the door. He helped with my suitcases. I hugged him goodbye. He got back in the car and drove away. I walked up the ramp and rang the doorbell. Hello, welcome. Are you new? Yes, come in. And that right there was the beginning of my new home. That was seven years before I entered SLAA. That was the day that I became a legal sex worker. That was a day that changed my life. How did I get to that day? In this story here, um, why I chose that story was because um, we, we learned a lot about me. I was on a pathway to a new and peaceful life. I had body image issues. My relationship had brokenness. We were watching porn. I believed everyone thought I was crazy and a liar. I was eager for a different life. And once I commit to something, I won't back down. What the story also tells you was I was being set up for a life in isolation, a life with limited outside communication, a life of secrets, and a place I called home. What the story doesn't tell you was I spent the previous year and a half with what I thought was a sexual awakening, what I now know as acting out. The pattern of acting out typically occurred after a breakup. I would go out with two or three people and capture the third or fourth for a long-term relationship. He happened to be the fourth. I turned him into my sex addiction and my love addiction. And together we created fantasies that we then turned into reality. I also subconsciously became his perfect girlfriend. I turned into his personal porn star, then later his, his favorite working girl. I became a chameleon to all my environments. I was anything he wanted, not because what he asked me to be, but because I chose to be what he wanted because I didn't believe I was good enough myself. So was he right when he said, why not get paid for something you enjoy? He wasn't too far off from where I was going. I had the recipe for sex work. This is part of my story where I could go back and forth as a victim survivor and then go into, no, 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 it's all my fault and, was, and it was my choice. 
The reality of the situation is I was more than happy to become available and enter into a new promised lifestyle that also included my sex and love addiction. Over the next several years, my life slowly went from on top of the world to not so much. A year prior to finding SLAA, I ran out of the house after a 36 hour entrapment of questioning with an armed man. I ran down the street to an unknown neighbor with an open garage. I banged on the door, no answer. I hid in the garage. That neighbor came out armed. I then ran down the street until the cops arrived. I had no ID, no keys, and had only two choices that night, go to jail or tell my story and go to a shelter. I told my story and off to a women's shelter I went. I was, it was a warehouse that was just full of bunk beds, women and children everywhere. This place was packed, cold, and everyone was coughing. They took pictures of my entire body. I received clothes, a towel, and some soap. I took a shower without shower shoes, which I don't know if you all know me, but that's a big no-no in my world. And I cried and cried and cried. This woman spoke to me after I got out of the shower and said, oh, honey, we've all been there. When you're ready to talk, we're here. I slept there that night and left in the morning with an all-day bus ticket. The only phone number I knew was his number and my mom's house number. I walked into over 20 places. No one allowed me to use the phone. I had no money. All the pay phones had disappeared over the years. No way to call collect. I had no idea how to ride a bus without a schedule. I was confused, tired, and scared. It took me over three hours to find the bus station and then three hours to get to the store around the corner from the house. That day I called the cops and he went to jail. I grabbed all my belongings I could and went home to my mom. A few weeks later, I went back to the industry and a few months later, I was right back into the same relationship. I even thought to myself, this is never going to be over. He is always going to be a part of my life. I need to accept we will always be connected. We might even be married to other people and still have to get our fix on each other. These were actual thoughts that I said to myself out loud. The next year was bad. It was really bad. I was making less and less money at work because I was drinking and an emotional wreck. I'd be high the majority of the time I was home. We'd be extremely happy one moment the next one moment and then the next screaming and yelling at each other. I would run out and stay in hotels for a day, for a, a few days and then go to work a few days early. I gave the relationship status the power over my emotional state. If we were good, I was good. I made him my higher power. The relationship had some high intensity moments prior to the life, my lifestyle change. But as I continued in the industry, the relationship ran the cycle that coincided with my work schedule. This new cycle was fast. I was at work for two or three weeks at a time and came home one or two weeks. I created a neurochemical pattern that released all the feel-good hormones and then came home and would crash if we didn't have the same rate of sex. I had created the neurochemical dependency. To offset this, I made sure to capture my partner at any chance I could to get my fix. Our sex life became a ritual of dressing up for hours on end, wigs, hair dye, outfits, dancing, porn. It was a long drawn out process that went on for days. The intensity of the relationship became more and more volatile. I ran out of the house eight times in the previous five months. I had conversations of, or we had conversations of let me go from both of us. I didn't know how to stay and I definitely didn't know how to go. I'd come home and pack only to fall in love again and run out a few days later. I found myself one day on a curb in the middle of the desert. No home in sight, just a paved road. And this 75 foot curb, I screamed at the top of my lungs. I cried out and I decided I was going to walk 54 miles home. Then my phone rang. It was the madam. She called to ask if I needed her to come pick me up. A month later, prior to my next work week, I ran out of the house with my purse and my car key. I hid for hours, 
I went to pick up my car late that night only to find it packed. We had our normal texting feud of blocking, calling. He turned off my phone and we started emailing. I went to work and only to find out I had nothing I needed for work. I was done. I was livid. I was paying the bills and now didn't even have the resources to complete the job. I called the only person I had left in my life, my mom. I landed on her couch that next day. The chaos continued for days and days and days. It was 10 days before I could arrive at the treatment center. I spent 10 days reading every single text, listening to every single voicemail, listening to all of the craziness. I did not respond. I was able to get up off the couch the first four days. I had enough anger and spite in me to move on with my life. But day five, that was it. My mom was driving me insane and I was losing my strength to not answer the phone. I called the treatment center and begged to be brought in early. I was so scared I was going to go back. That was the beginning of withdrawal for me. Yet, I had no idea what withdrawal was. I couldn't get off the couch. It was everything in me to let my mom take me to the store to get me some clothes. And everything I had in me to pack, to go. And absolutely everything in my power to not lose it on her. I finally landed in treatment. I had no idea what to expect or how to proceed. All I knew was I was safe and I was there for 45 days. I could finally breathe. And remember, once I commit to something, I commit. So I was not leaving. This is where I was introduced to SLAA, where I sat for the first 30 days, not allowing myself to identify at all with any of the characteristics or the stories. In fact, I thought everyone was off their rocker. Um, so that's kind of where my recovery journey begins. Um, once I finally accepted after about 30 days of going through the characteristics and going through treatment and doing some, um, inner child work, um, definitely admitted that I was, uh, a sex and love addict and am powerless over my sex and love addiction. Uh, it's definitely an intimacy disorder. A lot of it comes from child, some past traumas and also um you know just personal belief systems so once i came out of denial my time at the treatment center was almost through and i was then faced with a real problem i wasn't ready to go home at this point though i was going to leave the industry but in my mind the relationship was still a possibility after we fixed ourselves which would take two years. In my mind, it was two years. We'd have to fix ourselves for two years and then we can get back together. I'm not sure why, but that's the way that my mind worked. And um, I did set bottom lines and those bottom lines right at this moment uh, were no contact with him, no dating for a year and no sex outside a committed relationship. And why these bottom lines? Well, no contact with him. That was to keep me safe um, physically and emotionally. And no dating for a year. Well, if I couldn't date him, I wouldn't want to date anyone anyway. So, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Agree to that one. And then the no sex outside a committed relationship. That one I was okay with. The one thing that was just confusing for me was how was I going to not have sex? I mean, the longest I had ever gone since I started having sex was three months. So um, that was really just how was that going to work? So I set the bottom lines. Uh, in order to keep the, the bottom lines, I also had to examine all of my sex accessory behaviors. So I completely left social media for over nine months. I did not have any Apple devices that would be able to connect me to him in any way, shape, or form for the, over a year. Um, that way I could get, I had to grieve the loss of my Apple ID. It sounds crazy, but I was really attached to all of the things I bought with that Apple ID. So I later also found it in my best interest to get a completely new email. About eight months into sobriety, I received an email from him in one of my backup emails. And that was kind of like the main email I was using at that point. So I had to um, just completely create a new email. I was also to not have do any high intensity workouts. And that was to help with all of the chemical repair 
of the addiction part of it. So all those feel good um, brain hormones and receptors that were happening during that time period, um, I basically needed to crash the system and then restart it and um, just break the cycle. So I agreed no high intensity workouts and then also no arguments with my mom unless a therapist was present, which means that um, I had to learn how to communicate um, constructively. <laughs> And um, I definitely needed help uh, in order to do that. I created a painting that is um, sometimes known as the red light system, but I, do a, I did a green, yellow, and then a black hole. So all of the paintings, the, the green part of the painting um, had written in it all of my top line behaviors. And then the yellow were all of my midline behaviors. And then the black were the accessory behaviors. And then at the very bottom of the black was the black hole, and those were my bottom lines. So I found that to keep that present. It kind of helped me stay on my top line behaviors on a regular basis. I, after treatment, ended up going because I couldn't go anywhere. I had no place to go. Um, went into an IOP program, and that was uh, intensive outpatient program for an additional 90 days. After those 90 days, uh, or within those 90 days, the first seven, I, I went to my first SLAA meeting without anybody, so without being um, connected with another program person. I found a sponsor, and I agreed to go to all women's meetings and to go to four meetings a week. And I kept a 90-day journal of sheets that I created to make sure that I completed 13 to 15 things every single day. And I do just wanna go through that list for some um, of the newcomers that might be here because I found this really helpful to help keep my routine. So every single day I would call my sponsor. I don't know if I was really that great at that one. Um, I tried, um, but within that, I had to bullet what that conversation would be like. So I could not just keep it about me. So it was, how is she today? Does she have a moment to go over a sobriety briefing? What my sobriety look like? Um, what am I working on as far as um, step status or reading? Was there any program news? And also to remind myself to thank her. Um, so that's my little bullet point. My next checklist was I am sober today. So it's created in an affirmation form on purpose because I am sober today. And I needed to say that out loud to myself. And the next thing I would do was steps one through three. And in first person, and that was really important to me um, because it needed to, I needed to be part of it. So it's, I admit I'm powerless over my sex and love addiction, that my life became unmanageable. I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I have made the decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand God. The next checklist is the third step prayer. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of thyself that I may better do my will. Take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those I will help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. I then would check off what meeting I went to. My next two were outreach calls with the same little checklist that I had for my um, sponsor and then journal absolutely journaling was important every single day it was to journal about my recovery journal about steps one through three what characteristics resonated with me that day what signs of recovery resonated with me that day and then the last thing i would do is um talk about my faith that day and also where i was so if I was in withdrawal and in some pain, I needed to write that out and get it out of my system and then ha have faith that it's, I'm okay even when I'm not okay. So I had to talk about that and how to walk through that. The next thing I would do is make sure that I had meditate, meditated every single day with a, a mantra or an affirmation. My affirmations were, I am one with God. Be still and know that I am. I am powerless over my sex and love addiction. I am being restored to sanity. I am love. I am light. I am peace. 
I am beauty, I am joy, I am harmony, I am grace. The next thing I made sure I did was to read three to four pages of sobriety every single day, follow all of my withdrawal bottom lines, figure out what steps I was working on that day, even if it was just answering one question, at least I did one question. Stay away from people, places, things. People, places, things. So people is easy, that was just him, right? Um, places, well, I've already been uprooted, so that was kind of easy. The things, that was the hard part for me. Um, trying to stay away from reminders um, that might trigger me or set me off. That, um, that was a learning experience, needless to say, and learning how to use triggers as a resource. And then the last checkoff were the actual affirmations. So I kind of just went through what my affirmations were during my mantra. Uh, however, the very last thing I would do before I went to bed and also when I woke up and was putting makeup on in the morning was to say my affirmations in the mirror, looking at myself in the eyes, looking into me, and then after the affirmation saying, yes, I am. So I am safe. Yes, I am. So those were my, that was my little checklist. And I just want to talk about real quick, just going, getting through withdrawal. I don't, there may be people on this call that are brand new to this, to this program. There may be people that are seasoned, you know, they've been in program. Um, but as we walk through um, each day in sobriety, I, at least I have found that I can be withdrawing from a lot of different things, from my friendships. I just broke up with one of my best friends. So now I'm in withdrawal of that friendship and learning what withdrawal looks like for me was really helpful and is helpful even still to, to today. So what is withdrawal? Um, for me, it was learning to stop wanting what I want, to learn how to accept that a new pattern must exist, how to break the cycle. What did it, how did it show up for me? It was depressive. I couldn't get up off the couch some days. It was everything in me to get out of the bed, body aches. I absolutely thought I was gonna have a heart attack, um, like in pain, like going to have a heart attack. Um, where I really noticed it, and um, maybe not so much in the early part of withdrawal, but later on I became self-serving. So as my, in sobriety, my vision has, it widens, it gets clearer, more clear every single time that I talk, I speak, I work the program, um, things are just clear and literally my peripheral gets wider. Now, when I'm self-serving, my peripheral closes and I'll start running into people when I'm walking. And so like, that's a physical thing that happens for me. And so I realize, oh, I'm self-serving, what's going on? And so I have to check myself. And um, sometimes I don't even know, I have to journal. So that's how withdrawal shows up for me. How do I get through withdrawal? So for me, it was to create a routine. So I did bookends for my daily life. So I would wake up, do a meditation devotional, some type of exercise, get ready for work. So it's kind of revving up the day. And then at the end, I'm revving down the day. So I'm going to do some type of exercise um, whether it be yoga, walking, something, and then journal, meditation, and then go to bed. Um, I kind of already talked about affirmations, which helps with reframing. Top five greatest things that happened that day, as well as six things of gratitude. So what is the difference? Five greatest things that happened that day are actions that occurred. Five things of gratitude are reminders of um, what I had. So maybe in today's society, it could be a cell phone. You know, when the cell phone was taken away when I was in the treatment center, I had a withdrawal from that. So I'm grateful today that I have access to a cell phone that is like a mini computer and I can function and do work on it. And um, so that's the difference for me versus gratitude versus the greatest thing that happened. Community, huge, huge, huge in withdrawal. Um, what I have found is that when I reach out to people and find myself in community, um, the pain lifts. 
so I can only hold so much pain when there's other people that are supported and in a circle around me, they actually take part of that pain. They hold the space. And so community is huge, huge in program. And whether it's sobriety sisters, um, for me, I had to find multiple different community or different communities. So I needed a support group. I also needed a faith-based community. I needed different areas. Um, in order for people to hold the amount of space I needed. <laughs> um, but also um, in withdrawal, to get through it, I had to be kind to myself. So instead of wanting someone else to take me out on a date, I took myself out. And then that meant no phone. I mean, the phone went with me, but the phone wasn't allowed to hit the table. So it was actively participating in my own space, in my own head, and noticing um, objects around while I was eating dinner somewhere or lunch. Uh, recognizing that withdrawal is a grieving process and accepting the fact that it's just going to take some time before I feel better. Withdrawal is not a fun thing. The stages are not. Um, but learning how to grieve through the process and sit in the emotions was huge in the learning process. And some days I was really angry with the learning process, really angry. And um, but that's how I got through withdrawal. Another part of recovery for me is learning how to forgive myself, learning how to not only forgive others, but myself is what brought me out of shame being able to move from it's all my fault and this is me, this is my actions into a new space of this is not me, this is what I did and learn how to forgive myself for those actions and being able to look at it as a learning experience and being able to move forward. So, Forgiveness is huge. I wrote probably three different forgiveness letters to myself. Um, I do not have it present in order to read it, but um, you know, it, it's hard. Be kind to yourself. Working the steps is the foundation of recovery. Um, and I'm not gonna dive in here too much right now. However, um, steps one through three, I still do every single day. Steps six and seven, character defects, and then removal of our shortcomings. Um, to me, it's all, it's a process of reframing, le learning what my defects are and how to work within those defects. They, um, our shortcomings do become removed and being able to look at that on a regular basis. So an example of that could be my perfectionism. So where it could be an evil for me, um, to look at. It's also really awesome on the work side because I'm very detail oriented, but learning how to embrace my flaw as a human is beauty. So we all have um, characters and I, like, I'm learning to love my scars from that. Recovery in general, um, especially within SLAA, um, is a formula. And letting my higher power control what that formula looked like for me was huge. I'm just gonna briefly rattle off. It's kind of a summary of what I just went through, what that formula was for me. Treatment, 135 days. Therapy, started with weekly therapy. Bi-weekly therapy, it's now more monthly or as needed. Program, so this program, having a faith-based community, whatever that faith base is, a um, community of support, so that could be family and friends, a sponsor, working the steps on a regular basis, support groups, so for me it was an abuse support group. Um, I'm now currently looking into an industry support group because that's where I am in recovery right now. Um, a group where I'm constantly learning. So whether it was education, which I'm in school now, but prior to that, um, it may have just been a six week course in something. Routine, no dating so I can work on myself and get to learn who I am. Oh, a little funny story about that. So uh, the other day they didn't have any mayonnaise when I was getting a turkey sandwich. 
So I got mustard. I put mustard on my sandwich. Guess what? I love mustard. I, my ex hated it. My other ex hated it. And so I just quit eating mustard. But I, in high school, I always put mustard on my turkey sandwich. So I'm learning to love what I love again. Um, so that was part of, let's go back to the formula, little side note there, reframing my character defects, sticky notes all over my walls. So those sticky notes could have been um, quotes, they could have been affirmations, um, just little things here and there um, that reminders of who I am. Affirmations in the mirror, learning how to grieve, having gratitude, uh, reconciling relationships, and I'll go into that in just a little bit. And uh, motivational speeches. I listen to a lot of people um, on YouTube. And if you need suggestions later, um, please just email me or, or send me a text. Service work in this program, but also in the community. Uh, leadership roles, taking them when I'm asked to versus shying away and running away from them. Setting goals. So instead of setting all these long-term goals that I always did, um, I started breaking those goals down and doing short-term goals so I can start attaining. So I felt like there was progress moving forward. Brain food. So making sure that I eat healthy on a regular basis and I'm not overindulging and um, which that goes up and down for me, but it's really important to me because I can be more clear headed um, to make sure that I'm eating right. So I just briefly, want to talk about the gifts one of the gifts that we have in this program and that is reconciling relationships now um you heard the story that of the relationship i was in and that story um i don't know that that relationship should be reconciled um but the one with my mom could and we lived a life of love and hate um from the time i was a teenager all the way up until a couple of years ago. And for me to call her um, during that last moment, she was the last person I could call. I had nobody left. And she went to family week with me and learning how to communicate with her through recovery. Now she, she at 73 years old, she did her own work as well. You know, how and what, I don't know what program she was working, but she was doing something. But what recovery taught me was learning by making choices that I chose, it in turn caused a ripple effect with her in our communication style. You know, it took some time and we were able to do it. Um, those of you that have or may have not followed me during this season, um, my mom did have a heart attack uh, last April and I was able to spend the last four months with her and um, guide her and during the COVID season, um what did that look like that looked like me visiting her at a window for three three times a day and having conversations being able to pray with her being able to um just get to know each other and embrace each other and love on her and one day she just said to me i don't deserve you and to be able to walk her through as a woman of dignity into a space where she was able to learn how to love herself in her last days and forgive herself for wherever that shame was coming from, but to be able to recognize it and walk her through that during those last days, that's what recovery is for me. It's being able to reconcile those relationships that we thought were broken and were gonna be broken forever. The blessings that also come from this is intimacy with your higher power, intimacy with self, intimacy with others. In my mother's last days, I was able to have a healthy intimacy with her. 